It must be that time. Good to see you here. Trust you're doing well. Grab your hymnal and turn under 284, a shelter in the time of storm. If you're able to stand, stand with us and let's sing this together. 284. The Lord's our rock in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary time of storm, a shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm, no fears, alarm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of time of storm will never leave our safe retreat a shelter in the time of storm oh jesus is a rock in a weary land a weary land a weary land oh jesus is a rock in a weary land a shelter in the time of storm oh rock divine oh refuge dear a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. All righty, good evening. Good to see you. There was some gray clouds out there, but it's not storming around here, amen, And uh, but he's still our rock, amen. amen. Good to have you here tonight, trust you're doing well, good to have some folks visiting with us, and I just met for the first time a few moments ago, uh, Terry's sister back there and some of her family, good to have them with us tonight, and, and we're so thankful they're here with us, and, and good to see you visiting with us once again, and, and Miss Melda's only visiting here for a couple of weeks, and then she's going off to Canada, but just for a week, right? 12 days. Oh, she's extending it now. And, uh, but, <laughs> and, uh, but really, Miss Barbara is moving here. She's got another month there in Texas, but it'll take all that to get her closets packed up. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> but good to see it, you of you here. And the birthday girl's back there with us tonight. So we missed her this morning. Good to have Kaylee here tonight. She had a birthday yesterday, and uh, she's growing up. My, my wife and I just weeks ago was talking about and how some of the people in the church over the years, we've watched them grow up and getting older and moving on. And wow, you know, it so quickly happens, you know. And uh, so we're glad to have you here tonight. Let's pray and ask for his blessing upon the service. Amen. Uh, Lord, we come to you tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for all that you do for us. Be with us and guide us, Lord. I thank you for the privilege to call upon you in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for the guests and the visitors that went our service. We thank you, Lord, for Miss Jeannie following you in believers' baptism. We thank you for... The testimony of the saved, Lord, how this morning she shared with us just before she was baptized that she has no doubts of her salvation because she believes the Bible and she believes that when she asked you to save her, you came into her heart and saved her and that you would never leave her nor forsake her. Uh, Lord, what a promise and what a precious truth that is. I ask you now to help us this evening to know whom we have believed in and, Lord, that we will live our life to please you. Thank you for those that are here tonight. Thank you for every smiling face. Thank you for the beautiful weather. Well, maybe we give you all the praise for your worthy in Christ's name. Amen. Now be seated. Keep your hymnal, though. Turn back to 263. 263, we have an anchor. Have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the 
tough job if you don't believe it try it and uh, so uh, good to have you here tonight come on forward gentlemen if you would and we thank you for all that you do uh, for one another and for your care and prayers for one another don't forget uh, that the men's Bible study resumes on Tuesday uh, our Monday in the school of the Bible of course on Mondays at 6 30 uh, next Monday I won't be able to go because of our class but it's also on Tuesday but down at uh, Coronado Baptist Church in Tucson but Bob Gray the second will be down there preaching uh, the 6 o'clock Monday night for supper the service will follow 7 o'clock on Tuesday night I am going to try to make it Tuesday night for that meeting and that's next week and then the ladies meeting uh, is following on the 15th down at Sun and Shield if you didn't register for that already you, ain't not, you are not going to get registered for that they already filled up and 350 or 60 ladies signed up within the first couple of weeks and uh, that's in Marana but then they, later in the month of 28th and 29th ladies meeting up at Valley Baptist in Mesa and there's still some places available for that one. And so don't forget about that. And let's be involved in all these things if you can. Appreciate your care and concern one for another. We do want to pray for those that's away from us. Those that are traveling, several of our folks are doing that. So ask for to bring them back safely to us again. And we're thankful for what he's done for us even this day. Amen. Uh, but Austin, if you would ask for his blessing upon the offering.
265, 265, my anchor holds. Thank you for that. voices up unto the Lord, and I pray that when you uh, sing these songs, you realize that's what you're doing, and I pray as we sing the songs and read the words on the page that we realize what we're saying, and uh, I pray that we understand uh, that we're singing doctrine, and that we're speaking truth, and that we want to apply that to our life, amen? Uh, I hope that it's uh, not, and there was times in my life, and I'm sure there's moments in all of our lives where uh, they are just words on a page. Uh, but it's not designed to be that way. There's a message behind these songs, and these songs we sing are doctrinal truth, and it's songs you can understand the words of and even understand the meaning of. Amen? And uh, so uh, we want to ask the Lord to help us with that. If you have your Bibles tonight, you'll be turning over to Isaiah chapter 55. I said this morning we had, during prayer room, I said this morning that we had uh, uh, some visitors come in. Several came in from uh, Miss Jeannie's baptism. We're excited about that and thankful that she was able to Father, Lord, and Believer's baptism this morning. And then uh, I also uh, mentioned that we had some of those folks come in. Uh, they drove over here from California just to be here for her baptism. Uh, they got in yesterday and, and uh, didn't want to, didn't follow her to church this morning, but they did come in for the end of the service for her baptism. And I said to those in the prayer room, I said a lot of churches would have been done by the time they got here, but not ours. So they got at least 15 more minutes of the, you know, they got the overtime stuff there, you know, and uh, so... Uh, they got the invitation of it anyway, and, and uh, pray the Lord would use these things. Amen? And I thank you for befriending these folks. I didn't really get to, on days we baptize, I don't get to see a lot of folks uh, on the way out because we're, we're getting dried off and changed and things like that, so I don't get to see a lot of those folks. 
Uh, but I thank you so much for showing kindness to them and, and uh, making them feel welcome. And we pray the Lord would use these things in their time here. Don't forget on the back of your bulletin a couple of addresses there for John and Sue as well as uh, Tommy McGlone. I'd encourage you to drop off some notes and of encouragement there uh, to each of them and let them know how things are going. Ask them how things are going there. Uh, and uh, John and Sue kept their phone numbers. Now their phone system's been messed. They don't have great service there. It's not, I don't think it's service. I think it's their phones. So we're going to try to get some new phones. Uh, but uh, they've been having poor service where they're at. Uh, but they are going to keep their same phone numbers, or at least it, for now it looks like it. And then Tommy there, he told me to tell everyone, you are more than welcome to call him or text him, except for he's in classes every day. He applies tomorrow morning at McDonald's at 9 o'clock, uh, is, is, is an interview, and then he has, it's lights out by 9 o'clock our time, phone's off, so you'd be better off writing him a note, is what it basically boils down to, all right? And, uh, and uh, so... Uh, uh, he's been keeping up with me every couple of days. He'll shoot me a text or a call me, let me know how things are going. He's excited about it, and uh, so I'm excited to hear how today went for him there and how many they had on their bus route and things, and then also be in prayer for Jay Prescott there in Mesa in the rehab facility as he tries to get some of his strength back from the stroke. As I talked to him today, that was one of his uh, concerns. He said, I just don't feel that I'm getting any stronger, uh, so pray for better Jay that maybe through this he can get some of his strength back. Amen. Isaiah chapter 55 uh, this evening. Uh, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55, uh, in verse 8, the Bible says, uh, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, uh, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, uh, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that, that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Let's pray, Lord. We come to you tonight. I thank you, Lord, for the word of God. I thank you for the message, uh, Lord, that we can read and learn from. I thank you uh, that as we open the Bible, we open uh, your mind, we open your thoughts, your heart, Lord, and you speak to us and guide us as the the Word of God is quick, it's alive, it, it sharpens us, uh, it makes us uh, more aware of our surroundings, more aware of your will, and Lord, it makes us aware of our sinful condition if we're unsaved, it makes us aware uh, of, our, uh, of our being a child of, by faith. If we are saved, Lord, it helps us understand obedience, it helps us understand consequences. Lord, through your Word, we find out all we know of heaven and, her, heaven and hell, uh, we know all we know of, of, of you and the angels and we know all we know of damnation and the devil. We know uh, all we know of righteousness and sinfulness, Lord. So I pray tonight uh, that as your word is open, that you would guide us and instruct us. Help us to understand uh, what it is that you would have us to know. And may your will be done here tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Isaiah chapter 55, chapter 55 uh, verse 8. Now the Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Notice this, saith the Lord. So we all have to... First thing I want to talk about real quickly is we have to understand who the speaker is. <laughs> uh, now, we can often look at the Word of God, and one of the things that we study on our Bible Institute, uh, some of the things that we go through on our Bible Institute are uh, kind of academic. By that, I mean uh, we do like Old Testament survey, New Testament survey, uh, where we don't have time to dig deep. We're just skimming the surface. We're, uh, we're kind of mowing the grass, if you will. You, you know what I mean? Uh, we're going through who the author is. Uh, the dates of the book, we're, we're covering the theme of the, of the books, we're covering some things like that, uh, how you find Christ in those different books and, and some special features and the key verses. And, uh, but the reality of it is uh, all of us need to be in God's Word. Uh, things like that, that, I use the word academic, that may be a little academic, a little bit uh, studious, if you will, uh, are still helpful to us. And then there's other classes that we teach and we go through in our Bible Institute that, that are a little more in-depth, a little more... Uh, a little more, uh, we dig a little deeper. We get into a little thing, a uh, little, uh, our shovels out, and we dig up some nuggets every now and then, you know. And one of the things that I do, I, I, over the last probably five years now, I've been making a lot of copies and handing out the answers. Now, by that I mean there's nobody has to write them down. Now, they still take some notes and take some supplemental things, but they don't write down the answers. And the reason we do that is because uh, the first couple of years that we started the institute and we were going through it, I was teaching that and everybody was taking notes and it was, it was kind of, uh, my pastor, when he, when he was alive, he, he got, on occasion he would go on a mission trip and he spoke for different countries, different languages, so he had interpreters there. He called them interrupters. 
And uh, because he said when you're speaking through an interpreter, that's what they do. They just interrupt you because you have to stop at some point in time every sentence or two and let them say what you said. And he said it's, it's a tough process to learn to do. And uh, for me, going through that and, and just uh, giving the time, giving the, I mean, giving the, the notes and then having people give them time to write them down, uh, it was a little slower, a little less... Uh, we didn't get the opportunity to dig as much. How's that? We didn't get to excavate very much dirt uh, because everybody was taking time writing down things. Uh, so back a few years ago, I don't know, probably five years ago, I started handing out the notes. And, and now basically people write down some supplemental things, but I hand out lots of things. And the reason being so that I can kind of then cheat through it. We can kind of talk through it. We can dig a little bit. Uh, I like that personally. I, I like the skimming the thing. I like the, the getting the, the highlights of the subjects. But the reality of it is uh, I love what we find in some of those things, you know, and I love how it uh, prompts us to dig a little deeper and find out why the grass is so green. You know, we want to know what's in the dirt, you know, and uh, find out what nutrients are there and what makes it so rich. And uh, so it's interesting to do that. Uh, but if we find out here who is speaking uh, here in Isaiah, uh, and it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your, my way, your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Uh, notice in verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So the Lord is still speaking here, and he says, basically what it boils down to is this, if we think we know it all, we know nothing. Because his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and just like the heaven is higher than the earth, his thoughts and his ways are higher than ours. So when we think that we have all the answers and we think we have it all figured out, we don't even know the questions. I mean, really, you know, often we think we got all the answers, we don't even know what the questions are. And, and, and sometimes we get proud and arrogant and, and prideful, and, and it's just our, it's human nature to do so. It's human nature to kind of uh, have things, you know, that you want things to come your way. And, and we all kind of want to be liked, and we all want to be uh, accepted, if you will. But the reality of it is uh, there's a fly and a bug flying around here. Somebody want them? I will give them to anyone that wants them. And uh, at first it was a little moth, and now it's a fly. So it's like, what's the deal? I thought I got a bath this morning. But, uh, and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we have here uh, the Bible declaring that God is speaking. He says his ways and his thoughts are not our ways and our thoughts. They're higher than ours. Uh, they know more than us. They see more than us. And therefore, uh, it's like having uh, God looking down on our life, and he's guiding us by his word and by the Holy Spirit instructing us on where to go. We can only see so far, whether it be in the future or down the road, or, but he can see further. And looking at the whole picture, if we're looking at us from above, looking at us because his ways and his thoughts are higher than ours, he's looking down at us, and he looks down at us, he can see if we make this turn or this choice, that's the wrong turn, the wrong choice is going to take us off course. It's going to cause heartache, it's going to cause harm, it's going to cause discouragement. Uh, but if we make this choice and to be obedient in this area, it's going to bring much blessing. It's going to bring much encouragement. Uh, so we need to understand, we think about the word of God who is speaking. Verse 10 now, it says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, uh, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now there's a, a colon there, and we're going to stop there. We're not stopping the sentence because the sentence didn't stop, but we'll stop to catch this thought. It says, it's giving us an illustration here in verse 10. It says, for we, I mean, it says, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, we understand right where that comes from, right? Sometimes the wind may blow it sideways, but really it, it originated from above, all right? And so it comes down from heaven and returneth not thither. So uh, it may be raining and it may be blowing sideways, but really it doesn't rain from the ground up and it doesn't snow from the ground up. It snows from the up to the ground, all right, from the top down. And uh, so uh, he says, notice this real quickly. He says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud. In other words, he said, There's a reason that I send the rain and the snow. There's a reason that it comes from above. Because the earth needs it. I'm sending the rain, I'm sending the snow, to bring forth, notice what it says, uh, to water the earth, and br making it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So it's not just the fact uh, that it waters and irrigates the seeds that are sown, but then those crops that grow produce more seed so that there can be more crops and more seed to have more crops and more seed to have more crops. I thought about this years ago, and you ever have these thoughts that you, that you think, I'd like to do this, and you never do it, and you look back on it and you say, I wish I'd have done that back then. You know, like when you bought a house, you wish you'd have planted a shade tree. 
20 years later, there's still not a shade tree in your yard because you never planted a shade tree. You wish you'd have planted a shade tree 20 years ago. You, you see what I'm saying? Now, think about this. Years ago, I was teaching on, we had a season of sowing here at the church. In the, in the springtime, we was having a, a missions conference, and instead of emphasizing on foreign missions that particular year, we were just moving into the building next door. We were moving out of, out of a house into this building, into the first building, I should say, next door. And as, out, uh, as a result of that, uh, we decided that spring to have a season of sowing. We had taken a few months, and we had been working on our uh, church so much, and people had been working so hard and giving so much of their time and resources that we thought, you know, we're going to have a season of sowing. We're going to emphasize, we're going to anchor ourselves in, evan in evangelizing and witnessing to our neighbors and to our community. And, and, and we want to be involved in foreign missions, and we are, and we support that on your prayer uh, sheet. You'll have a list of all those that we support, and, and we want to take some more on. And we want to do foreign missions, and we want to do other, other work, but the reality of it is we also need to be busy right here where we are. So that year we had a season of sowing, and, and we had taken and decorated a little bit and done some things. And, and out in the foyer of the church, I had, hang a, I had hung a, 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 a corn planter on the wall. Now, this is a manual corn planter. Some of you have seen them. You stick them in the ground, and, 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 and you pull the thing open, and it spreads the earth, and it drops the seed, right? And then you pull it up out of the ground, and you can step on the ground, and it matches the seed back together. And you've seen those, right? Maybe some of you have. Some of you used them. I hung one on the wall there, and it's, and it's for sowing seed, uh, and it's for putting the seed in the ground. And that year, uh, I said to someone there while we were working on the building or whatever we were doing, I said to someone, I said, you know what I would like to do? I'd like to go down here to one of these farms where they grow different crops, cotton and grain primarily. I'd like to take just one of those, uh, tear, one of those wheat stalks and, and tear off the head and then take the seed and let that seed be, everybody see how much seed come off of that one head. And I'd like to take that seed, and I'd like to take it down here on the corner or somewhere to, to one of these farmers, and the, I know a bunch of them, and, and say, can I have this little corner right here, and can, can we plant this handful of wheat or barley or grain or whatever it was, you know? Can we plant this? And I'm sure they would have said, yeah. <laughs> you know? I'd like to have that year planted that and then fertilized it and watered it and, it, and when they harvested all of theirs we go out there to our little big corner that we had roped off that was you know one foot by one foot or whatever you know a handful of seed don't take a lot of room and I wanted to tear the heads off there and pull the seed out of every one of those stalks of wheat and then the next year replant those seed from those stalks and we'd have to have a little bigger area now because we have more seed from that stalk from that head from those heads and then the next year, the next year, and if we'd done that several years ago, like we said, then, then now, what, and then I, what I, my goal was, the idea of being there, eventually I would like to have had that seed, that one little handful of seed, reproduce to where we could have harvested the wheat and had someone, and we could have made some bread for everyone to have eaten off of that little bitty handful of seed, off of that one head of that one stalk of wheat or whatever the case may be. That's the way it works. A plant produces more seed than just the one stalk. And that seed then goes forth. And we understand from the Word of God uh, that that seed would be a, an analogy, there would be a picture of the Word of God and, 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 and witnessing. And some of that seed, not every seed that falls from that stalk is going to take root. Some of it's going to feed the birds, you know. Some of it's going to be snatched up. Some of it's going to be blown maybe aside and it's going to land on the road. It's going to be run over by the vehicles that go by the, the farm and, and whatever. And it's just going to be ruined. And some of it may fall into the bar ditch or something where there's more moisture and, and weeds grow and, and they choke that out and it starts to grow but it doesn't produce a head because it gets bent over with the rain or run down the bar ditch and it, it bends the stalk and chokes the nutrients and there. It forms a head but the head doesn't form properly. It doesn't produce the wheat that it should. And, and it's, it's like kinking a garden hose you know and that literally happens when you see the wind blow their wheat fields over that's what happens the danger of that is if they fertilize it too much it grows too tall and and does before it heads out it may blow over it gets too heavy and it, it kinks it and it literally will hurt the production of it but then the reality of it is some of that seed will fall right in a in a fertile spot of ground and that fertile ground will produce that seed, and that seed will grow, and, and that that one seed or that two seeds that falls is going to produce a whole head or multiple heads with a lot of grains of wheat in it. 
I say to you tonight, when we think about the Word of God, Isaiah here in Isaiah chapter 55, the Lord is talking about His thoughts and His ways, but He also goes on in verse 10 and 11 to talk about the Word of God. He says, just like the rain and the snow come from above, to water the ground and to, bring, and, and to cause the earth so it may bring forth and bud, it says in verse 11, He says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of thy mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Uh, John Phillips said, Our words are primarily legislative. In other words, we can tell people to do stuff. We just can't guarantee that they're going to do it. Right? We can make all the rules and all the laws. And we can say, this needs to be done, do this, do this. But we can, all we can do is say that. But he says God's words are executive. They're legislative because God says this is what I want done and this is what I need done. But they're also executive because they make it happen. <laughs> they execute it. You know, We have different branches of government and, and we have an executive branch of the government. They're, they're there to enforce the laws and yet even the best they can do is futile. People break the laws all the time and get by with it. If you've driven on between here and the interstate, you see people break the laws every time you drive on that road probably. And they get by with it most of the time. The point is simply this. Our executive branch of our government is there to enforce the laws of this land that has been put in place by the legislative branch of government. But the best they can do is say, this is what we suggest to be done. This is what needs to be done. This is what can and cannot be done legally. But the best they can do is futile. But God says, in verse 11 here of his word, he says, so shall my word be. What does that mean? It comes from above. And there's a purpose for it coming. He says, it, he says so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Uh, it shall not return unto me void. In other words, it will not return without producing. <laughs> the Bible says his word uh, doesn't return void. He says, he said, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. God's word will not ever break God's heart. God's word will never disappoint the heart of God or to the heart of the believer that has Christ living in them. God's word says it will accomplish that which I please. Just like the rain and the snow cometh down uh, from above, uh, so his ways and his thoughts are higher than our ways and our thoughts, and therefore his word that cometh forth out of his mouth that he gives to us and, he's, and he, he allows to be recorded for us to hold and ha have in our hand, he says it will not return void, it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. Let me say this real quickly. Not only will it not return void, it's going to produce, but it's not only going to produce, it's not, there's not going to be tares in his wheat field. It will produce what pleases him. There's not going to be weeds and thorns that comes from God's word. God's word produces that which is pure, acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. Now I know people say, well, and, and, and we all know people that say they're a Christian, and we see things in their life, or we see instances in their life, and we see people often fall, if you will, but that doesn't mean that God's word failed. That just means they were weak because all of us are weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? And we understand that the weakness of man uh, is always strengthened by the word of God, but until we get that glorified body, we still are carcass, we still carry around this sinful man, this sinful woman that we are. And as a result of that, we have these tendencies of the world. And why would that be? Because the Bible says the world is at enmity with the, things, with the spirit of God and the things of God. There's a war going on. Ephesians chapter 6 reminds us of that war. It's not a war between flesh and blood. I'm not fighting with you. You're not fighting with me. At least we shouldn't be. The war is spiritual warfare. Uh, there's, a, there's a warfare that's taking place against powers and principalities, against people in, 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 that's set up in high places that's being guided and steered by the, by the spirit of the devil instead of the spirit of the Lord. They're being guided by the spirit of the Antichrist instead of the spirit of God. And as a result of that, they're making life decisions. They're making decisions for those of us that live on this earth and in, this, in these areas uh, that, that they're over, that they're ruling over, if you will, and have dominion over it, not in dominion like the king of kings, but nevertheless, that we, we live in a prince and the power of the devil. The air that we, that we live in, the world that we live in right now is his domain. It's not always going to be that way. One of these days, Christ is coming back. When he comes back, he's going to be the king. And not the president of some country, not the king of some country. He's going to be the king of the world. He's going to sit up on the throne of David, and he's going to rule and reign this earth. But right now, the devil is loosed. Right now, he's trying to discourage and, and depress 
He's trying to destroy. He's trying to inhibit. He's trying to stop the power of God to go forth in your life and mine. But the Bible says God's Word, and this is why it's important we understand what, that we understand and we read God's Word. So shall my Word be the, that goeth forth out of my mouth. He says, it shall not return unto me void. This is the Lord speaking. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. So as God sends forth His Word, through, through these holy men that recorded it for us the, to write it down without error, without omission. God records it for us that we can have and hold in this generation. And he says, when I send my word, my word will be pleasing to me. And it won't be pleasing to me, but it will accomplish what I sent it to accomplish. It will not return void. The word of God is so powerful. If you will, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll quit real quickly. And... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I wanted to encourage you tonight about the Bible. I said a few weeks ago, one of the real dangers of the world that we live in is that so many people that are religious by definition know very little of the Bible. Most people only know what someone told them. They never opened the Bible to confirm if it was truth or a lie. They never read the Bible. It's important that we know what the Bible says. I'm not mad at anyone. I'm not mad at other people. But I am bothered by false doctrine. I am bothered by those that teach false doctrine. The Bible says of, of those that teach, and, and the Bible says that there's a greater accountability that they're held to. And for those that teach a false doctrine, the Bible says that, that, that God is going to deal with them. I want to make sure that when we open the Bible that we teach the truth. And I want to make sure that none of us get confused about that. I, I, I am not perfect by no means, and I, by no means do I know everything. But I know that I can trust the Bible. <laughs> and if I can find it in the Bible, it's a trustworthy source. Regardless of what religions may say, denominations may say, religious people and leaders may say, the Bible is our source of truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I say to you tonight, we don't have time. We won't even take time. But I challenge you sometime, look, do a study in the Word of God about what benefits the Bible has in the life of the believer. Do a study sometime of what the Bible does into the life of the believer. It's an amazing thing. The Bible says it's bread. Think about that. When we, when we read the Bible, we're literally being nourished. It feeds us. As Christ is teaching, he says to the preacher boy, and I'm going to use that because I want to include what God's given me to do with my life here, but that's what he says. He says, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Now, let me say this. Just a few moments ago, just before service started, Miss Barbara walks in my office and hands me a Tupperware container, a Rubbermaid container, some kind of container with a lid on it. How's that? And it's warm. On the bottom. I said, what is this? She said, it's jalapeno poppers. I said, did you just make these? They're still warm. She said, yeah. And I said, after church, these will be consumed. <laughs> jalapeno with cream cheese wrapped in bacon. Yeah, those will not last long. <laughs> then I asked Miss Cindy a few moments ago, I said, did she make any for you? She said, no. And I said, she loves me more. <laughs> now, here's my point. When he says, feed my lambs and feed my sheep, he don't mean that I have to make you jalapeno poppers every week. Or popcorn every week, or hot dogs every week, or salad every week, or whatever it is you like to eat. I don't have to do that. That's not what he says. So if I'm not going to feed you with food, then what does he mean that I'm supposed to feed you with? The Word of God. So when I say to you tonight, what benefit does the Bible have in the life of the believer? It's not just to be thrown upon a dash of a car so that when you come to church you don't forget it because it's always in the car. No. It's not to be thrown as a, somewhere to keep the dust from landing on that spot of the shelf. You know? It's not to be used as a, as, as a source of pride where you, you wave the Bible in arrogance and say, look at me, like the Pharisees did. That's not what it is. It's to be studied. It's to be read. It's to be applied. So I say to you tonight, if God said, and he did in Isaiah chapter 55, my ways and my thoughts are not your ways and thoughts, not only that, but my ways and thoughts are higher than your ways and thoughts. 
and he says, just like all of you know about the rain and the snow that falls from heaven and what the benefits of that is, you know that when it falls, it, it waters the ground, it causes the ground to be allowed to be fertile, it brings forth in buds, and therefore it produces seed, so that their seed can produce more seed, and that seed can produce a crop which has more seed in it to produce more crop. It's seed for the sower. He says, just like that is the word of God. I send it forth, he says, and what it does, it, it pleases me. And I send it forth because it changes things. It has benefits. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we find in verse 16 some of those benefits. And this is where we'll conclude. He says in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. First of all, we know that none of it's man-inspired. <laughs> it's all inspired of God. I said... Along, I said a number of times over the years, one of the first things, I don't know if one of the first things, but it wasn't very long after I surrendered to preach that God revealed something to my heart. Now, there's no new revelation, but he spoke to me something that he had never spoke to me about before, not to be from the pulpit, but not nothing, nothing new about the Word of God, but about my life. You know what God told me? He said, not every thought you have is inspired. That's pretty good for a preacher to know that, isn't it? But not every thought that I have is inspired. Some of them are just mine. I mean, yesterday evening, yesterday morning, I get a text from Brother Jay Shannon. If you don't know this, Brother Jay Shannon and Miss Becky are from West Virginia. Also, Brother Steve Morris and Miss Debbie down in Marana, they also are wet from West Virginia. So I'm surrounded by these people, all right? And, uh, and so yesterday morning, yesterday afternoon, if you don't know, in college ball, West Virginia played Tennessee, all right? So I got a text yesterday morning from Brother Jay Shannon, and he went into this big, long thing. Uh, warning, extreme danger. Uh, you know, talked about the, uh, this, uh, you know, I, it's on my phone. I have to read it to you. But anyway, about the danger for all those in Tennessee, be sure don't turn on any televisions or Internet or radio. Don't hear anything because they're projecting high scores, maybe even up in the 40s, you know, and, and just this whole, like this whole forecast thing. I text back, and I said, I've heard the West Virginia wind blow before. You know, we're not scared. Yesterday evening, I got a text yet last night from my dear friend Steve Morris. He says to me on, my t on that text, he says, that was a great ball game today, wasn't it? He's a West Virginia fan. If you don't know this, Tennessee got stomped, all right? And, uh, and uh, so I simply said to him, I said, there's no room in the ministry for opinions. You may have thought it was a good game, but some of us did not think it was. He texts back, he said, you make my wife and I laugh, you know. The point is this. When God showed me, <laughs> after I started to preach, hey boy, you don't know everything. And not every thought is going to be inspired, so guard them. Make sure that when you say something, it lines up with Scripture. Make sure when you go to the pulpit, you don't take opinion, you don't take your own ideas. Take the word of God to the pulpit. Because how else are you going to feed his sheep and feed his lamb unless you use the food that he provides for you? How else? They're going to starve to death. They're going to be malnourished if we give them only the things of this world. So I'll real quickly look at these four things we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It's given by inspiration of God, first of all, but... but but then we find out it's profitable for doctrine. In other words, the Bible will tell you what's right. That's what doctrine is. The word doctrine literally means right. The Bible will tell you what is right. We're living in a world where, where it seems like everyone says there's nothing, there's no absolutes, there's nothing that, that's always right. Everything can be wrong at times and everything can be right at times. That's absurd. Two and two has always been four and always will be four no matter what anybody says. You can put it on a test and the teacher might even, you can put it on a test and say it's five and the teacher might even check it right, but it's wrong. Two and two is four. Whether you add it or multiply it, it's still four. So we think about this. If something that simple as, as addition and multiplication can be true, then how much can we have confidence in the Word of God that has no error, has never had an error, it has no, no omissions, there's nothing left out that God wanted in it. There's no error, there's no conflicts, there's no contradictions. Everything in God's Word is consistent and true. And if we'll study God's Word, it'll feed us, it'll help us, it'll tell us what's right. But he also goes on in the next phrase, he says, for reproof. 
That means he'll tell us what's wrong. He'll, the Word of God will tell us what is right. It will also tell us what's wrong. In a world where people say, well, everybody's right in their own eyes. Yeah, that's the problem. We need to quit looking through our own eyes. Start looking through the Word of God and the eyes of God. The Bible says to be careful. The Bible warns us that we ought not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. You know what that means? All of us are wrong at times. So it's therefore the Word of God is profitable. It's profitable because it's inspired. It's profitable because it tells us what's right. It's profitable because it tells us what's wrong. But look what, it, look what happens here next. It tells us, it says, for correction. Correction is when you know you're doing something wrong, you find out how to do it right. <laughs> I thought about that some in the last few days as we're trying to do some drawings and trying to figure out some plans and for some a house and bedroom sizes and where to put bathrooms. And, you know, and when you're working with a structure that's already built, it's a little more difficult because you have limitations of where the plumbing can be unless you want to jackhammer and saw all the concrete up, right? And uh, but if you're trying to think about some things and how to adjust some room sizes and how to make some things work out and, and get the most optimal use and and also the aesthetics and the look that you want and the feel you're after and all those things. So I've been doing that, and I've been thinking about that in the last few days. I've been thinking about how I've learned some things over the years. I remember the very first building, the very first structure that I built. I was probably about 19, 20 years old. A guy wanted a garage, added on to his house. He came to me, and he said, uh, would you build me a garage onto my house? I had done a little few little odds and ends things for people here and there, little repairs, little things, but, but never had built something from the ground up. And I said, sure. <laughs> it's always good to do when, you don't, when you've never done it before, right? And he says, he says well, what do you charge me? I said, I'll tell you what. Uh, he wanted this two-car garage added onto his house. He wanted it. It was, it was uh, kind of a special type thing where he wanted it built because it was already rock laid and stuff like that. And, and I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll let me use your garage, as a learning experience. Now I said, I'll build it to code, and I'll get some, if I have questions, I'll, I'll get some answers. I said, I, I'll, but I said, it's going to be a lot slower process because I've never done this before. But I said, I'll build it for you for $1,000 total. I said, now that's, that's not material, that's labor. But I'll do it, and that's everything. That was pouring concrete, that was framing it, that was putting vinyl siding on it, that was roofing it, wiring it, hanging doors. I mean, it was a lot for 1000 bucks. He said, okay. Hey, let me say something. He probably felt like he got a really good deal, but I learned a lot on that garage. The very first day, I went and bought a bunch of vinyl, after I got it all framed up and the OSB board on it, I went and bought a whole bunch of vinyl siding and brought it out there, and I thought, well, this is easy. It locks together. I mean, I can stretch a string and run a level, and I can find out what level is, and, and I figured out how the corners worked. I mean, I'd done different types of things, a lot of things in the past, and been around those things, but I'd never seen anybody hang vinyl siding before. So I can figure this out. So I put my corners up, I took my vinyl, started nailing the cross there, I come in, I cut it the length, and nailed it all up. Or I come in, that was one afternoon, I, I went to work that evening, I worked in the morning, went to work in the evening. I come the next morning to go back to work on the garage again. I had to go into work every afternoon. So I come to work early, and, you know, and that whole side of that building was just wrinkled up. I thought, what in the world? So I called a guy, I said, hey, what's going on, man? I just hung this brand new vinyl yesterday. If I got bad vinyl, what's going on? He, talk, he said, did you nail it tight? And I said, yeah. He said, that's what you've done wrong. It expands and contracts. That's why it's slotted. You put the nail in the middle of the slot so it can expand and contract. And I had to take that whole side off of the building. And you know what? He felt like he got a good deal. It just took a little lot longer for his garage to get built. Now, here's the thing. Now, I know how to put vinyl siding on a lot of things in building, I'm just using building trade as an example, a lot of things down through the years, a lot of things I've learned a whole lot more about by just doing it and doing it with someone that had done it more often than I have. I've learned a lot more about certain things in the building trade. I've learned a lot of things about what's required and what's not, what'll work and what's not, what shortcuts a shortcut that you don't want to use and what shortcuts viable. Huh. I've learned a lot of those things. I don't know it all by any means. But I know enough of it now to where we're over the past few years, uh, I've built several houses, not only one for us, but I've built several for other people, and that helped fund our family, <laughs> you know. And I'm by no means I'm an expert. But the point being this, over the years I learned out in building some of the things that were right. I learned out some of the things that were wrong. And I learned out 
when I've done it wrong, how to make it right. Take the vinyl back off and nail it loose. Yeah, but I don't, ain't there any, isn't there, isn't there some way I can just pop it and, and loosen the nails up? Just take the vinyl off and put it on right the next time. The Bible will tell you how to live your life the right way. It'll tell you what's the wrong way to live your life. It'll tell you when you find out you're living your life the wrong way, it'll tell you how to get your life on track and how to get right. And then lastly, it says this. It says it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. Here's a, this, is a, this is a precious point. It'll tell you how to stay right. It'll not just tell you what's right and what's wrong and how to get right. It'll tell you now that you're right, stay right. And that's probably where most of us find the Word of God guiding us in our spiritual life. The Word of God instructs us and we find out things right. But after you've been saved for a number of years, if you've been faithful to church, you find out a lot of things that are right and wrong just by being in the environment of a church family and hearing the God, Word of God preached and taught and sang through the hymnals. But you know where most of us struggle? Staying right. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. And we even know how we can get forgiveness and go to God because He never leaves us nor, nor forsakes us. We know we can go back to Him. He'll always, call, every time we call upon Him, He'll hear us. We know that. But then we find ourselves falling down again. We find ourselves struggling again, stumbling again. We need to be in the Bible. I, w I forget who it was that said it. I wish I could remember all these different quotes I read from different people. But one man said, the closer we are, and I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not quoting it verbatim, but the closer we are to the Word of God, the less likely we are to fail. The less likely we are to stumble because we're preoccupied with mining the gold nuggets that we don't get so easily sidetracked. I mean, tonight, if I were to walk out here in the parking lot before anyone showed up this evening, if I were to walk out there in the parking lot and I were to take a diamond and I were to throw it down in that gravel parking lot. And I said, now after church tonight, there's a diamond out there in the parking lot that's worth $10,000. And I put it in the parking lot today. So after church, go out there and hunt for it. And whoever finds it can have it. Let me ask a question. How many of you would just get in your car and go home? I mean, here's my point. If you started looking for the diamond... If you started looking for the diamond, you, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't spend five minutes and just walk away and say, ah, it's not worth it. It's $10,000. Or would you start looking for it and say, I, I've looked here, and, you, and somehow you line your coordinates up with a block or a, a wall or a tree or a whatever, and you say, I, now I don't want to go back and look at this exercise. I'm going to move over, and I'm going to move over another one, another one, and you're going to be... You're going to be thorough. My point being, you're not going to start, you're not going to start looking for pennies because you're looking for a diamond. You're not going to get so easily distracted by things that are going on around you because you're looking for something that's very precious. The more we mine the Word of God for the truths and the nuggets of God's Word, the, the less distracted we are by the world around us. It helps us know what's right, what's wrong, how to get right, and how to stay right. Listen, there's so much the Bible has to say about what benefits the Word of God has for us. But I, I want to just encourage you tonight to remember, to remember this week, as you go your separate ways and you face different battles, and we all do, and different conversations ensue, and people say, well, you know what, I, I don't know that I believe that. Well, just say, well, can I show you from the Bible what the Bible says? I know I've said this in the past, but I'm telling you, I think one of the, the, the real deficits, the real deficits of our church in this day and age, not necessarily this church, but churches in general, one of the real deficits is we're starving to death. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're eating, but we're not being nourished. Uh, we're going to services, but we're not going to church. Let me say something to you. Even in a church, and I'm going to say this, not to be arrogant, but I'm probably a little bit partial but I don't even mean to be partial. I'm trying to be honest. I think if you come to this church, you're going to find truth. I hope so. <laughs> but you realize it's even possible to starve to death in a 
in the midst of food? My dad often has said of me, he said, I'm the only person he's ever met in the world that would starve to death with a refrigerator full of food. Because he fussed at me because I won't stop and eat, and if I'm only one of myself, I won't fix myself something to eat. <laughs> Do you realize, even if the Word of God is being preached, you can sit under the preaching of God's Word and starve to death if you're not in God's Word yourself? It's very possible. It's possible. I said to Tommy a few days ago, I said, Tommy, I want you to be careful. I'm excited about you being there. I'm excited. I'm, we're praying for you. I told him yesterday, he sent me a text last night. He said, hey, we're praying for your services tomorrow. And I said, we're praying for you too, buddy. Okay, just real quickly. But I told him, I said, be careful. Because one of the easiest places to backslide is somewhere like a Bible college. He's going to a good college. Great preacher, great ministry, phenomenal. You say, well, then why it's so easy to backslide there? Because everything becomes what someone told you to do. Do your devotions, read your Bible, do your studies, memorize this verse, and you're never doing it yourself. You don't have the desire and the will to do your daily devotions because you have to do devotions. You don't read the Bible because you have to read the Bible. You lose the want, and you end up starving to death with the food and with an ample supply of the food around you. I say to you, we need to be active. We need to be engaged. We need to be in the Bible. For me, when I was in Bible college, literally, I said this to many people, it was like five years of revival for me. I loved it. Honestly, I loved it. It was so exciting. Oh, it was hard. It was lack of sleep. Tommy pre, uh, shared with me a message that was preached in chapel the other day, and he was so excited about this message about the guy who went through uh, military training and, and and there during the training they they had a bail and some of you know this this uh, these, uh, this this example and, and you have served or know people served in the military and they had a bail there and they said anytime if it gets too hard for you you want to quit just go ring the bell he said that preacher in chapel challenged him he said listen you're in bible college and it's going to be tough and there's going to be nights with very little sleep if any sleep and there's going to be hard tests and there's going to be lots of studies and papers right he said don't ring the bell he said, because until you get through the basic training, you don't get to the advanced training. He said, don't ring the bell. And Tommy just went on and on talking about the things that that guy told him, and I thought, I love that. Listen, I like it that, that there's, there's an eagerness about him. When someone, and I'm not trying to elevate Tommy, I'm just saying he has changed addresses, he's changed environments, he's, changed, he's moved into a place where he knows very few people, he's moved into a dorm with someone you don't know, but he's eager. He's excited. Can I say to you tonight, sometimes we might just get too comfortable. We might need to be shaken up a little bit. Last thing, and I'm finished. I was watching a documentary on eagles. Amazing. Amazing. What a, what a majestic, powerful bird. But here's one of the interesting things about these eagles. They had the eggs, they, they hatched the eaglets off, and the eaglets got to a certain age, they, they was getting stronger, the parents knew that, so the day came when the parents was trying to encourage them to leave the nest, and this one particular one, they had the camera fixed on, this nest, this one eaglet wouldn't leave the nest. The rest of them had all left and flown away for two or three days, and they was all going out and flying and soaring just like eagles do, and it was gorgeous, but this one, he was sent up on the edge of the nest, and he would just flap his wings and, and, and just flap his wings, but he never would leap. So you know what happened? The mama landed like 20 foot away on another limb and didn't bring him any more food. She sat right there where the eagle could see her. And the baby would just, the, the young one would just make noises and, Mom would just sit right there. She'd have food in her mouth. She'd have an animal. She'd just lay it down at her feet. Maybe tear it apart. Some of the other birds, the other eaglets might fly up to where she's at, and she would give it a portion to them, or she, they would tear it from where she was holding it. But that would just sit right there. You know what happened? After, I don't know how much time lasts. I don't know if it was a, an hour or two or a day or two, but you know what happened? That one eagle in that nest said, if I don't get out of the nest, I'm not going to get fed. And I thought about that. I thought in my life, I thought, sometimes God has just said, I'm putting a 
I'm putting some crackers in your sheets. I'm putting a pebble under your bed. I'm going to shake you up a little bit so that you'll start digging in the Word of God and getting some of those nuggets out of you. You need to be fed. Get out of bed. And it's, it's interesting that the Word of God says, if you don't work, you don't eat. When's the last time you put some work into studying God's Word? When's the last time that we, we actually dug in the Scriptures, in the page of Scripture, and said, you know what? God, I, I, need to, I need to eat spiritually. And we had to put some work in. Oh, I know, it's easy nowadays. You turn on the Internet and say, Google, tell me what the Bible says about this. That's not digging. That's starving. Open the Bible. Get a concordance. Do some word studies. Do, figure out some meanings. Do some cross-referencing. Do some digging. Put some work in. And I'm telling you, well, we get so wrapped up with it that we won't be so easily distracted. We won't so easily fall because we're too busy digging, <laughs> you know? We need to understand what, how valuable God's Word is. We need to ask God to help us understand it and apply it to our life. Amen? Let's ask the Lord to help us this week as we witness to our family and our friends and our community, our neighbors. Let's ask the Lord to help us and guide us in this. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed tonight, I want to simply ask a question. We won't have any music. We can have, well, Mr. Stroh, if you want to come and play, that'll be fine. Uh, but we, uh, we won't have any singing or anything. I just want to ask a simple question. First of all, have you asked God, have you asked Christ to come in your heart and save you? Have you admitted to him that he knows more than you know? And when he says in his word that all is sin that comes short of the glory of God and there's none righteous, no, not one. Have you admitted, Lord, you were right, I'm a sinner. Lord, even before I knew I was a sinner, Lord, you told me I was a sinner. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you knew that and you pointed that out to me. Secondly, if you recognize you're a sinner, have you made a choice to ask him to forgive your sins? Have you asked him to come in your heart and save you? Have you asked him to show you how to get right? See, what made you recognize you were a sinner because compared to to the things of God and the Word of God and, and Christ Himself, when we compare ourselves to Christ, we can't help but realize we fall short. That He was sinless, but we're sinners. And because we compared ourselves to what was right, we know what's wrong. But now have you asked Christ to help you get right? Have you asked Him to come in your heart and forgive you for your sin and, and to save you? And the Bible says if you'll do that, He's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The Bible says that if He'll stand at the door and knock, but you'll have to open the door. But if you'll open the door, He says, He'll come in and He'll sup with you. There'll be time spent together. There'll be time growing and nourishing. Uh, you'll, be, you'll have that spiritual food that will, that will feed you like nothing this world can. Do you know Christ is your Savior tonight? Have you asked him to come in your heart and save you? And then lastly, if you know you're saved, if, you, if there's a time in the past, and it doesn't matter the date, it doesn't matter the age, but there's a time that you know, Lord, I, I know that I ask you to save me, and you promised to me that you would. And, and Lord, I'm leaning upon the truth of the Bible that you promised that you would save me, and, and therefore you cannot lie. So, Lord, I know I'm saved, but, Lord, I've failed. There's been things in my life that, that I've done, that I shouldn't have done. There's been things I knew was right and I've done them wrong. I've been places and engaged in activities and listened to music and wore clothes and, and, and participated in different events that, that I knew did not please you. And Lord, your word should not return void in my life. Lord, I want to please you with my life. Help me to be fruitful tonight. Have you asked God to help you get right again? And then have you asked Him to help you stay right? Have you asked God to forgive you? And have you asked God to strengthen you that you may be remain faithful? The Bible uses the word that way multiple times. As a matter of fact, it was the very first message that John the Baptist preached and the very first message that Jesus preached. Repent. The word repent doesn't just mean forgive me. 
It means forgive me and give me the power to never engage in this again. To never be like this again. Lord, I don't want to be this way anymore. Lord, I'm repenting. I'm ashamed. I'm not just sorry, but I'm ashamed that I ever was or I ever said or I ever did those things. Lord, help me not to, not to be that way again. Are you there tonight? Are you there where you've asked the Lord to help you because the Word of God's given you the instruction to, to know what to do at whatever segment of your life you're in? See, one of those four areas relate to every person in this room. Saved or lost, one of those four areas of the Word of God from 2 Timothy 3, 16 will, re will relate to your life. You're either right, you're wrong, you need to get right, or you need to help, help staying right. So as the Lord speaks to our hearts tonight, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us and guide us in this. If you need to talk to someone, if you need to, someone to pray with you or show you more of God's Word, please, we'll stay as long as we need to after the service to do so. You can come forward right now if you need, but don't leave here without applying the Word of God to your life. His ways and His thoughts are not ours. They're all oh, so much higher. Let's let Him be pleased tonight with our life. Let's ask the Lord to help us as we pray right now. When we come to you tonight, I thank you, Lord, for the Bible, the Word of God. I thank you that we can hold it and cling to it, that we can trust it. I thank you, Lord, that we have a source of truth, and a source that we can learn how to practice. A source that's never changing. A, a source that's settled forever in heaven. A source that comes straight uh, from the mouth of God to the hearts of men. Lord, I ask you this evening to help us and guide us. All of us in this room need you in our daily life. We need you, Lord, to guide us and help us. And Lord, if there's anyone in this room that's unsaved, Lord, I pray that you let them recognize their need of you right now. Thank you for those in this room. Thank you for the volunteers next door that's keeping the nursery. Bless them for that. And Lord, keep everyone safe going home. But Lord, most of all, Lord, I, pr I pray that right now the Holy Ghost will do a work. That if anyone needs to get right, Lord, they would meet with someone before they leave here tonight. And together, they may meet with you. We may get right. And leave here pleasing you with our life. We ask these things in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Be sure and visit with one another. Thank